In this video, I'm gonna go through the bike and kit that I use to Everest, the Paso di Valparola in Alta Badia. Now, there will be a full video on the ride itself. So stay tuned for that, especially if you're a big fan of watching others suffer in an undignified way. But in the meantime, I thought it'd be great to give you more insight as to the bike and kit that I used in more detail in case you're planning an Everesting yourself or perhaps just if you're doing a really long ride with loads of climbing, there should be some good advice here for you. My bike of choice for the Everesting was my absolutely beautiful Canyon Ultimate CF SLX climbing bike which I absolutely love. Now I also am lucky enough to have a Trek Madone disc at the moment as well, but I chose the Canyon out of the two because the Trek Madone disc, it's, it's amazing to ride, it's really fast, aero, and you know, it's got disc brakes, but with that comes about a kilo and a half of extra weight. And for an Everesting, a challenge all about going uphill as quick as you can, I decided that the lighter Canyon was the way to go. Something else I love about the Canyon is that I feel really balanced on it and really composed and stable when descending. And that's really important because descending is a huge part of Everesting. You've got to come down every time you go up. And having said that, I sense that people are going to be screaming at the screen saying, well, why don't you use disc brakes then? Well, there's an answer. Okay, so disc brakes, I believe they offer a massive advantage on steep descents, technical descents and in the wet. Now the Paso de Valparola, and part of the reason why I chose it is that it's not a technical descent and it's not especially steep. And so I can get away with running calipers. And with regards to it being wet, well, had it been a wet forecast day, I wouldn't have attempted Everesting. I would have waited for a dry forecast. Having opted for calipers, I wanted some really light and stiff wheels. Unfortunately, our mates happily lent me a pair of these absolutely beautiful Firecrest 202 tubulars. Onto them, I glued a pair of 25 millimeter Continental Pro Limiteds, which I managed to blag, because uh, normally they're only available to the pros, but thankfully we have some friends at Continental. And the advantage they offer is that they actually have a latex inner tube inside them instead of the standard butyl tube, which saves roughly five watts of rolling resistance per tire. And the cool thing here is that that's constant. It, it's not like drag that increases as you go faster. Even when I'm crawling along at five kilometers an hour up, up a climb, uh, it's still giving me five watts back. These wheels are absolutely beautiful to ride and they feel great on the climbs. And well, I feel like I needed all the help I could get, especially when I was getting tired towards the end. Um, and yeah, absolutely brilliant. But I'm sure many of you are thinking, well, riding tubular tires poses a risk. What if you get a puncture? I don't have a team car helping me and give me a spare wheel. So I had a backup plan. These, my trusty 404 NSW clinchers that I normally run when I'm riding this bike the rest of the time. So I didn't have these carrying around on my back. I actually left them at the strategic base camp of Everest, well, with the Hotel Fredora, which was about a third of the way up the climb where we were staying. And this was really useful logistically because I left loads of stuff there like food and bottles and my spare wheels. So had I got a puncture, I would have carefully ridden down to the base camp at the Hotel Fredora and just swapped out my wheels. They're a little bit heavier and you know, not as good for climbing as the 202, but the 404 NSW, I mean, it's not to be sniffed at, is it? It's still an absolutely amazing wheel. I still feel great. The next thing we need to talk about is gearing, which is really important for an Everesting challenge. And I put a lot of thought into this. So normally I run a 5236 chain set and an 1128 cassette at the back. And for normal riding around where I live in the south of England, well, on shorter hills, it's absolutely fine and sees me through. But I was worried. So what I did was I spoke to a lot of experts who'd Everested previously and looked at the climb and spoke to uh, my coach, Jacob Tipper. And we decided to go with a 34 tooth inner ring on the front chain ring and also an 1132 cassette. This is something that Shimano doesn't recommend though. Having a 52 and a 34 is a big drop between 
the chain rings and Shimano reckons that you run the risk of dropping your chain. Now, having done it, I can testify it does work. It's a bodge, but it does work and it works fine. But the shifting performance between uh, a 5234 and a 5236 is noticeably not as good. Um, you, you, you're better off sticking to what Shimano recommends, but I didn't drop a chain whilst I was doing the challenge and I haven't dropped a chain yet using this setup. At the back, I went for the 32 cassette. Now, that's a 32 Ultegra cassette because Shimano doesn't do a 32 tooth Jura Ace cassette. And the way that you can get that to work, and I've done it before, I did it when we rode up the Angleroo, um, was if you wind the B-limit screw in on the Jura Ace derailleur, you can get it to work with a 32 tooth cassette. And again, this is something that Shimano doesn't recommend. The Jura Ace rear mech is actually only rated to a 30 tooth cassette, but it does work with a 32 and you get the full range of gears as well. I'm absolutely delighted that I went for a 34, 32. It was the greatest decision I've ever made in my entire life. For the first half of the challenge, I, I didn't really need the 32. The Valparola is not the steepest climb in the world, but as fatigue started to set in and I was absolutely crawling, I was so glad I had that gear. And even when I was crawling along, I was able to sort of still spin my legs at a decent cadence and not overload my knees and get too tired. So my advice would be if you're planning on doing a ride with loads of climbing, more than you've done before, or an Everesting, then go for a gear that you think is easier than what you actually need. The next bit of kit I wanna draw your attention to is my absolutely beautiful Physique Arioni Zero Zero. Now, not only does it look absolutely stunning at the top of my bike, it's also a really light saddle, but that's not the main reason I picked it. The main reason I have this on my bike is because I find it really, really comfortable and saddle comfort can make or break any ride. But if you're gonna be riding an Everesting, which you know took me 15, 16 hours, then if you have a saddle that is uncomfortable, that could be the difference between completing it and not completing it. But I really get on with this saddle, I love it. With regards to the cockpit, I went for the Canyon integrated one-piece aero bar and stem. And the reason for this is that, well, it's, it's lightweight actually, which is a bonus, but also I get on with it. I like the shape of it, I feel comfortable on it. And it's nice and narrow, it's about it's 41 centimeters width, which keeps you a bit more aero. And I don't have the widest shoulders, so it suits me well, but also, aerodynamics still matters on an Everesting because every time you go downhill, it matters. You're going you know, really fast. But also on the Valparola, the first half of that climb averages just four and a half percent. And at that sort of gradient, at the speed I was going, which was over 16 kilometers an hour, you know, that aerodynamics is still a massively important factor in propelling you forward. So anything that can be done to tidy up the front end of the bike is gonna make a big difference. That's why I went for it. And also to tidy up the front end, I've got this nice mount here for my Wahoo, and I've got my Wahoo Bolt computer. It's a nice lightweight unit, but the most impressive thing about this was how long the battery lasted. So I managed to get 16 hours of battery out of this, which, I mean, that was a full on rundown test I did during the Everesting. And I did turn off some features to get that though. So I turned off the backlight, I turned off the LEDs, um, and I also turned off Strava live segments, didn't need those. But yeah, 16 hours, really impressed with that. When you're doing a long endurance event, pacing is absolutely crucial. So for me, the best pacing tool that you can have is a power meter. So to help me with that, I've fitted a Quark D0 to the Canyon. Um, and I had a pacing strategy during the Everesting, which was to try and average 240 to 250 watts on each ascent. This worked well for the first half of the event and then fatigue set in and, you know, I was uh, sort of crawling, just managing what I could. I'm just completely empty. I'm crawling. Still worked well as a motivational tool to try and hit a particular number and just keep going and turning the pedals over and keep going. So it was still really useful for that, I, I just think, you know, I was perhaps a little bit over ambitious with my initial pacing, but in defense, it's very hard to train and prepare and predict how you're gonna respond in an event that's 15, 16 hours long. The big take home message that I wanna 
ram home is to prioritize comfort when you're doing a really long endurance challenge it might be the hardest ride of your life my everesting certainly was and you're feeling even more tired than rocky at the end of a training montage than anything that you have that just makes your life a little bit more enjoyable and a little bit more comfortable just you just really appreciate it um, but we're now going to measure the bike and give you the vitals so saddle height or seat post length i have that set on my bike at 77 centimeters from bottom bracket center to middle of the saddle top the stem here that's 110 in the integrated cockpit uh, 110 millimeters and we'll weigh the bike as well so let's see how it's doing should be pretty light so the bike's weighing in at in a full build with pedals and a power meter 6.8 kilos one final piece of advice which might sound obvious but i'm going to say it anyway is just thoroughly service check your bike test everything out and check that it's in fully working order if you've got di2 charge it if your brake blocks need changing change them you know i was training months and months for this challenge and i wasn't going to let a, an avoidable mechanical scupper it so yeah if you've got a big ride planned just just check everything's okay I hope you found this video informative and useful. And if you have any questions about my bike, kit, or setup that I use for Everesting, then just bang them down in the comments section below, and I'll do my best to answer as many of them as possible. And if you're looking for another video to watch, then why not check out the Presenter Challenge where I rode this same frame up the Angleru in, uh, or Angri Angrilu in Spain. Um, I went very slowly. To watch it, click on my name, top tube vanity sticker here.